James Edward Martin, United States Marine Corps, Korea, the Forgotten War. I had the pleasure and opportunity of meeting and interviewing Ed Martin in Las Cruces, New Mexico, December 1st, 2007. He was 77 years old. He passed away about a year later. He was a Marine's Marine, folks. This is a great story from the Korean War. He joined the military, joined the Marines, 18 years of age in 1948 was part of the, the Pusan landing in June of 1950 in Korea, saw some combat there, and then the Big Incheon landing September 15, 1950. First with the 1st Marine Brigade, which became the 1st Marine Division, and uh, just one of the best stories of the Chosen Reservoir. Those of you who are uh, big on history will know what that battle was, and you need to listen to this. This is good. This One of my New Mexico veterans, I miss him. He's up in heaven. He's going to be up there in the great reunion we're going to have. So, But this tells a great story. It was with a 75 recoilless rifle platoon in Korea and fought other battles and skirmishes. But just, just like I said, a Marine's Marine. I think you're going to really like his story. I want to thank Brandon Glidden again for making it possible for you to listen to Ed Martin's story and all these stories from Korea. Thank you, Brandon. Love you, brother. Thank you for your service in the U.S. Army and our, for our country and just your dedication to my work and the project that I'm doing. And just really thankful, Brandon. Folks, if you'd like to become a sponsor of this work, it's easy. Just click on the link in the video description or go to my website, LarryCapetto.com. Click on Sponsor or Vet. Include the veteran's name. That's all there is to it. If you'd like to donate to my work, there's information in the comment section. Voices of History Radio continues 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. KBOH, Grand Junction, Colorado. Sharing a lot of these stories and I'm going to start premiering some some stories on the radio station that aren't here on this YouTube channel so you need to tune into the radio station so you can hear that so I would be premiering stories like I said that aren't here I've got hundreds and hundreds of stories so I want to I want to do something special for the radio station so you're gonna hear some stories there that you probably aren't gonna hear here so I want you to listen to both platforms if you can okay all right I think that's about it for now thank you for subscribing to this channel and uh, sharing these videos Let's keep this thing going, folks. Like I've said many times, freedom is not free. Freedom is earned. There's a price to pay for our freedoms. Our young people need to hear these stories because within these stories are, are the foundation of our country, why we're free. I like what one veteran told me recently. I think it was Frank Hackett. He said, every combat veteran, excuse me, every person in politics in an in a elected office should be a combat veteran. Let that ring. Let that ring through your ears, okay? Thank you for watching. God bless you. I joined the Marines in uh, August of 1948. Okay, 48. How old were you at the time then? I was 18. So, first time in the military, obviously, first time away from home? Yes. When, where did you go to basic? In San Diego or Paris Island? San Diego. Do you remember your first day boot camp? Yes. Do you? Was it chaotic? It was chaotic, but I expected it. I was well aware of what was going to happen. So I just took it as kind of laughed it off. Uh, another guy and I that had, I had met in Minneapolis or that we went ended up going there together. We just made a big joke out of it, <laughs> which made the drill instructors, at first it made them mad. They used to beat us over the head with their pith helmets and and then they finally started laughing with us and banging us over the head with the pith helmets. But Were you prepared mentally for boot camp when you said you laughed? I mean, was it a mental thing that you prepared yourself for? Yeah, well, we knew, uh, I knew what was going to happen. I had talked to other guys that had gone through it. Okay, so. so you were kind of prepared. So yeah, I, I took it as, well, this is what's going to happen. So what, 
what's the big deal? Was there a lot of pride when you graduated, though, from boot camp? Sure, yeah. sure. So this is 1948. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, what year did you go over to Korea? I went over, sailed in uh, June of uh, 50. And Sean? Oh, before that, Pusan Perimeter. Was that, uh, did you engage in combat there? Then? Oh, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about that landing and going in there? Well, we were the first, Marine, first provisional Marine Brigade, and uh, uh, we went in over there, and uh, we became known as the Fire Brigade. We were pretty well trained, and uh, when, when the Army would get pushed back in the perimeter, we'd move in and relieve them and push the North Koreans back. And then we'd let the army take over. And then the North Koreans would push in some other place. We'd move over there, push them back. And so, that, that was our job. We were the fire brigade. So was this your first engagement in combat? Yes. Pusan? Not at Pusan, at uh, Chindong Ni. Can you tell me about that first engagement, what happened and what your role was in that first engagement and how you felt as a young Marine? Well, it, it uh, was scary, uh, but same, same with everybody else. We, all of our staff NCOs and uh, most of our NCOs were World War II veterans, so uh, we were pretty felt pretty good about their competence, and uh, so we felt pretty confident. Were you and, fighting the North Koreans at this time? Yes, North Koreans at this time. And was it a skirmish? Was it a, a two-day battle, this first engagement? Just a, a sporadic fire? What was going on? Well, we were, we were taking territory back, so we were in the attack. We were taking back uh, high hills. Uh, to straighten the lines back out. It was a road juncture that we were pushing the uh, North Koreans away from that l road junction. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were there about five days. Uh, we pushed them back out of the way. And then they, we were replaced by the Army again. And then we headed off to Kaesong. Uh, we were pushing the North Koreans again back away. And uh, after a couple of days of that, the 3rd Battalion, uh, which was two companies and uh, part of our platoon, which I was part of, we were called back to Chindong Ni again because the Army got pushed back and to uh, recapture their artillery and push them back till the rest of the brigade could come back and straighten it out. And then after that was done, then it was up to the, uh, they had, North Koreans had pushed across the Naktong River. And uh, so then we got trucked up to the Naktong River to push them back there. And, uh, first engagement there. I was in an anti-tank 75 recoilless rifle platoon and uh, we were walking up the road at dusk one night moving forward catching up with the rifle company and a jeep went by us up the road and pretty soon it came back run you son of a bitches the tanks are coming. So we grabbed our guns and hightailed it off the road up to the side of the road and set up our guns. And about five minutes later, three Russian T-34 tanks came over the crest of the hill and firing and their cannon and machine guns. And about a minute later, why they were all knocked out and uh, burning, and one of our guys got uh, wounded. 
by the, one of the machine guns off one of the tanks, that was all. And uh, some bazooka guys got wounded. Now, what Marine division were you with? First. Okay. But at that time, it was just a brigade. The division hadn't come over yet. The division, the full division, didn't get there until the Inchon landing. So, after the first Naktong, we went back to rest and we were going to get ready for the end to join the division for the Inchon landing. Well, the Army got pushed back at the Naktong again. We had to go back to the Naktong. So, uh, we battled there for a few more days, and at midnight in a rainstorm on about the 12th of September, we got relieved by the Army again and trucked back to Pusan so we could get ready to board ship to join the fleet to go up to the Inchon Landing. And we landed there on the 15th. And was it uneventful, or what happened at Inchon? Oh, in Inchon, it, it was a fairly easy landing. Uh, 3rd Battalion went ashore in the morning at 5 a.m. and took Wamido Island. The rest of us laid out on the, on the ships out in the bay because there was a 30-foot tide. Tide dropped 30 feet, and if you weren't in the ship's channel, you were sitting in mud. So. It, Five o'clock, they were able to get the 3rd Battalion ashore on Wamido Island, and then the tide went out. At five o'clock that night, the tide was back in. The rest of us could go ashore at Inchon proper. So we went ashore at Inchon proper that night. And the resistance was eh, fairly light. Uh, we had casualties, but uh, not bad. What was your rank at this time? Corporal. Were you, did you have a squad or? No, I was a loader on 75 recoilless rifle. Okay, so you, oh, every Marine's a rifle then, but you were doing specifically on the recoilless? Yeah. And, okay. And that was your job throughout Korea? Yes. So were you care, physically carrying a lot of equipment when you would march in or go in, I mean, on your back, or was it being trucked in, or what, I mean? Uh, our recoilless rifle was, uh, mounted on a 50 caliber machine tripod and we carried it on a heavy machine gun cart. So we pulled it, except when you went up a hill you had to carry it. It weighed 100, and the, the tripod weighed 54 pounds and the gun weighed 110 pounds. So you manhandled it up a hill. So let's, let's, let's march on towards you know, October, November, December of 1950. Tell me about your, your, your journey and your trek into the Chosen Reservoir. Well, we uh, went ashore at Wonsan on October 29th of 50. And uh, we were around gradually working our way up north. And uh, on uh, Thanksgiving, November of uh, 50. We were on the east side of the Chosin Reservoir. We had a Thanksgiving dinner on the east side of the reservoir. The next day, we boarded trucks and we were trucked the 5th Marines. The 7th Marines were already at U Dam Knee. The 5th Marines, which I was part of, we trucked up to U Dam Knee and joined the 7th Marines. Let me ask you a question before we go any farther. Tell me about the Army being overrun in that vicinity. Do you remember hearing stories, or maybe you relieved them? Didn't the Army, before you went to the Chosen, didn't they, like the 9th Army or something, the division get overrun? Is, did that happen? That was the 31st Re Army Regiment, I think. Uh, Faith's group uh, was on the east side of the reservoir. They replaced us. And when we were on the uh, west side of the reservoir, when the Chinese attacked, they got overrun and practically wiped out. Um, which was at the same time when we got surrounded, 
they got it on the east side of the reservoir. And uh, they were ill-prepared, uh, unfortunately. And uh, they just broke and ran. Uh, they didn't have uh, any control. What was their objective? To do what you were going to do? And they just were, when you say ill-prepared, what do you mean by that? I don't think they had the training that uh, their officers and men had enough training together. They had been in Japan and I don't think they had a lot of field training in that before they got to Korea. So that when they, uh, when they got hit, they didn't know what to do. So uh, they broke. And uh, it, at the same time we got hit, they got hit. And they, the survivors came across the frozen, chosen ice, walked across, and came to Hagaru, where the Marines were. The first Marines were holding Hagaru at that point, or a part of them. And uh, Lieutenant Colonel Beale, who was a uh, motor transport guy, he took trucks and jeeps out on the ice and drove around and picked up survivors from the reservoir itself. And he even went ashore on the other side where he saw trucks sitting. And he founded wounded army, found wounded army guys in the trucks, and he hauled them out and put them on marine trucks and took them back across the reservoir to uh, Hagaru. Now you mentioned Thanksgiving and the next day. Take, pick it up from there. I mean, it's you guys. Next, next, next day we were trucked up to you damn knee, and that uh, that had to be about the. 26th of November, I think. And uh, we were supposed to advance on the 27th of November. We had orders at that point. The army on the west coast of Korea had been attacked and overrun. So we had orders from MacArthur, instead of going straight north to the Yellow River, we were supposed to switch and pick up a road and go west and try and relieve the pressure on the army on the western shores. Well, when we tried to do that the next day, I think it was the 20, morning of the 28th, that's when we ran into our Chinese buzzsaw. And uh, that night they locked the roads down, cut them, and we were surrounded as of the 28th of November. What do you mean by bus saw? Explain that. Well, there were, if you believe the statistics, there were 120,000 Chinese around us in the Chinese armies. We, we had been broken up. We had people at a uh, small group at Chindong Ni, way at the foot of the reservoir, down below the mountains. We had some, some of the 1st Marine Regiment at Coterie. We had some of the 1st Marine regiment at Hagaruri. We had a battalion, no, we had a reinforced company at, of the 7th Marines at Taktong Pass, and the rest of us were at Udam Ni. So we were stretched out 42 miles. And we, and we were what? 
full support division, maybe 20,000. And um, so we were in a buzzsaw. Our roads were cut. We had one road, one single lane road all the way up. And uh, we had, at uh, Udamne, we had two days supplies. Uh, ammunition, artillery, food, etc. So from that time on, everything had to be airdropped. And the Air Force did a good job airdropping us supplies. So we're in, we're at Udamne, and there we're encircled completely by the Chinese, and we're fighting to stave them off, to hold the high ground. And that goes on for, I think, until about the 1st of December, uh, not sure of the dates, about the 1st of December. That's about 57 years ago today. That's Today's the 1st. Yeah. So describe the combat. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to picture this. You guys, you're, you're surrounded. Are they, do they all have weapons? Are they charging? Do you have well, night attacks, day attacks? The, we had air supremacy. Thank God for the Marine air wings. In the daytime, the Chinese couldn't move. So they fought at night. So after dark, they would come out of their holes and wherever they were hiding and they'd move in on us and they'd get ready and then the, the flares would go up and the whistles would blow and the bugles would blow and they would attack. And uh, many times the front ranks didn't even have rifles. They might have sticks, but they would charge, and then our troops would open up with machine guns and rifles and that, and they would see how we were positioned. And then the real charge would come in with the guys with the weapons and that. They'd try and find our soft spots, and they'd come in. And. Uh, they charge and <laughs> we'd mow them down like cordwood. And uh, they'd whistle and flares would go up and they'd disappear. And then because you couldn't dig foxholes in the frozen, it was 20 to 30 below zero at night. Every night, 20 to 30 below zero. So then the guys on the mountains would pull the Chinese bodies up and use them as parapets. Hell, by the time the attack was over, the bodies would be practically frozen already. But they'd drag them up and they could build parapets out of the Chinese bodies. And that's what they'd use for protection. And. Uh, the casualties on our side were quite high, too. And uh, when, when their break in the fighting would come, uh, the wounded, the, the Navy corpsmen, would, they did a wonderful job, but uh, the plasma was frozen. Uh, morphine syringes, syringes were frozen. They put them in their mouth to thaw the morphine so they could jab it and get it into their guys' arms and that. And then uh, the guys that were maybe wounded in the arms or something like that, that they'd have their arm in a sling or something, they'd take another guy by the parka, parka hood and pull him down the damn mountain to the aid stations. And uh, we didn't have many warming tents. So uh, 
soon as the warming tents filled up, they would, they took rice straw, put it on top of a canvas, they'd lay the wounded on that, and then they'd cover them with this, another sheet of canvas to try and keep them from freezing. And many times, rather than try and fix the wounds, the blood would freeze and they were better off just leaving it alone. We couldn't, f I don't think we, we flew out a few by helicopter. In those days, you could maybe take two guys out in a helicopter. Out on the, they were the old type helicopters, they had body things out on the skids, and that, that's all they had. But, um, so there were, you, you didn't fly many guys out. Uh, if you got overrun, you sent uh, your reserves up to try and push them back. You had to try and keep the high ground. And uh, this went on until about, the, as I say, about the 1st of December, while we were getting more ammunition dropped in and food and clothing and medical supplies. And uh, then we formed convoy on that one lane road. We threw all of our wounded and our dead that we could handle on all the trucks. We had wounded strapped to the hoods of Jeeps, and fenders, and fenders of trucks, and back of trucks. They'd haul dead down from the mountainside and throw them on the back of trucks. And uh, when it, we got too many dead, as I recall on the outskirts of U Dam Knee on the way out, they blew up and scraped a big hole and buried a lot of them. They mapped it out and graves registration took them and so that we had more room to put more bodies on. And uh, I was on the point with Taplet's 3rd Battalion on the way out of you damn knee and we were firing at pillboxes and knocking out houses and that on the way out uh, to uh, help the guys up on the ridges and that. How, how would you define the combat? I mean, you keep telling me things, but how would you have to, how would you define combat? Dirty. I mean, a lot of times it got hand-to-hand -hand for the guys up on the hills. I mean, it really got hand-to-hand. -hand. Uh, you found out that an entrenching tool was, you may not use it for digging, but it sure as hell made a good hatchet for hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Uh, you know, things like that. Uh, it, 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 it was down and dirty. And... Uh, the weather was your worst enemy, but it was also your friend. I mean, your guns jammed. Everybody that was there, for the most part, has got bad feet, bad hands. Um, but the Chinese had it worse than we did. It helped us. The Chinese had cotton padded uniforms. The old ear flap things, tennis shoes, not these kind of tennis shoes, but the old canvas tennis shoes that you had when you were a kid. Well, maybe you didn't, but but they were just canvas with little rubber around the base. That was their shoes, and very few of them had gloves. It was, and uh, it 
the cold got them worse than it got us. And you'd find them in foxholes sometimes, and they'd just be frozen to death. Not a wound on them, just frozen, just huddled and frozen to death. You'd lift them right out. So, and the prisoners that we had, uh, we had prisoners that we used to go along the truck convoys and pump up the air tires on the trucks. <laughs> their feet were so swollen that it was breaking out of their, their tennis shoes and they must have lost their feet when all was said and done. But, uh, so the colder is your friend, and it was your worst enemy. Uh, so which, it probably was a better friend than it was an enemy, as it worked out because of the odds of a 120 to 20. So. So it was mainly night battles that you fought? You fought at night because that was the Chinese way because they, they could move at night where they couldn't move in the daytime because our air support would knock them out in the daytime. But then we'd have to move in the daytime. So they'd have blocks, pillboxes and, and log entrenchments and that along the road and up in the hills and everything pointed down at the road, and they'd have those manned in the daytime. So then our troops would have to go after them in the daytime so that we could move the convoy in the daytime. At night we were in defensive mode. How, how do you feel as a young man, a Marine, I mean, you're in combat, you're seeing these things, you're, you're seeing the casualties, I mean, um, what, what gets you through those tough times? Is it your faith? Is it your training? How do you get through those hard times? Uh, it's your buddies. You know, they're here too, you know. It, uh, if you don't do it, they have to do it. Somebody's got to do it, you know, if you're in a group and yeah, you know, I was, I talked to somebody one time, Taplet, going into Hagaru, we were under direct machine gun fire and the convoy is going by and Lieutenant Colonel Taplet tells the gunner and me to get that damn machine gun nest up there. So we got to go across the road in order to fire because of the trucks going by. So we're running across the, the road and there's water about that deep in the road. And you see it in the movies, you know, guys running through machine gun bullets. That happened to me. We were running through and machine gun bullets spattering all around us. And didn't even think about it, just Get the hell across that road, get that machine gun. Later that afternoon, we got into Hagaru. We get to our collection point, and one of my best friends is sitting there, and he reaches up and he says, kind of close, huh? And I said, why? He said, well, you got bullet hole in your entrenching tool, and you got bullet holes in your parka. Oh. Somebody had to do it. Didn't even think twice. Go. Are you training that puts that in you, or? <laughs> Probably training, and somebody's got to do it. The other guys are getting killed doing their job. This is your job, and I get it done. There were, when we got to Hagaru, 
they flew out 4,500 casualties. That was wounded and frostbite cases. And they flew in 550 replacements. Those replacements were guys that had been wounded down south, got out of the hospital, and now they flew them back into where we are surrounded in the reservoir. I ran into one of them when we got to Hagaroo, and he was cussing, I, what's the matter with you? You dumb bastards. You got surrounded, and I got flown in here to as a replacement. But. So what's the objective of, of you, you, the Marines, and of the Chinese? I mean, who's, you're trying to push them out, they're trying to push you out, I mean, and then who, end, who ended up winning that situation? Who en ended up winning it? At that particular point, the Chinese pushed us out. Uh, but we were so badly outnumbered that uh, at least we got out with all of our equipment, just about all of our wounded and dead. So. You know, and the American people don't know a whole lot about what you're talking about. Isn't that amazing? And that's nope. why I'm doing this documentary because I've talked to a lot of men that fought at the Chosen Reservoir, and I'm, I'm glad you're sharing these things because they call it the Forgotten War. You know, do you know why they call it the Forgotten War, Korea, or they refer to it as the Forgotten War? People just went on with their life. Did you find at that time there was much interest from? our country about what you were doing over there? No. Your family did, but... How do you stay motivated to, and, and have a purpose in what you're doing when, you know, back home, people don't even realize what's going on? I mean, is it your training as a Marine, basically, that keeps you going? It's your camaraderie with your fellow Marines. Where they are, you are. Where they go, you go. So you're surrounded at the Chosen Reservoir. Uh, strategically, what, what, what was the importance of what we were trying to do, or, or military-wise, or geography-wise? Why were the Marines at the Chosen Reservoir? Because MacArthur wanted to capture all of North Korea and return it to the South Koreans. And the Chinese communists were not going to stand by and let that happen. And as we were fighting our way from Wonsan up north, we kept running into Chinese. Not huge numbers of them, but we were running into them. And they said that the Chinese were coming across the border, the Manchurian border. And it was reported back to headquarters in Japan. They just ignored it. And the good thing, because of General Smith's orders to go up that single track road and split our forces the way they were split is he drug his feet and he started building an air, airfield at Coterie and an airfield at uh, Hagaroo. And boy, did that save our bacon to be able to fly casualties out of those two places and fly in equipment and replacements. Tell me a little bit more about the cold. You mentioned some things, but just the practical aspects of what you ate, where you slept. I mean, tell me a little bit more about the cold. Well, we had sea rations. And 
It was difficult. Uh, there was sleeping. You slept on the snow. Sleeping bag? You had a sleeping bag. You had shoe packs that were worthless because you they were they were rubber bases up to your ankles and then leather up here and they had felt inner soles. But you'd march in them for a while and your feet would start sweating and because no and the, no air circulation. Your feet would sweat and that moisture would stay in your shoe packs. So then you'd stop. And you know what an insulator rubber is. You'd stop and you'd feel the ice between your toes and then your feet and that is that water in your boots froze. And you couldn't take your shoe packs off because if you got attacked, you could take them off and change socks if you had extra socks. And most of us carried extra socks. So you'd, you'd have a pair of dry socks, you'd put them on, you'd take your wet ones off and you'd put them in your armpits and try and dry them off from your body heat. But your insoles in that are still sweaty and wet. But, um, but you have to put your boots back on because if you were overrun, you couldn't run around in your stocking feet in 20 and 30 feet below zero. In fact, uh, <laughs> you weren't even allowed to uh, zip your sleeping bags up most of the time. Especially if you were up in the hills. So it was cold and uh, what you lived on, if you couldn't have a fire to thaw your sea rations, you lived on uh, the cookies, the crackers, the candy bar, and uh, you ate the fruit uh, like you would a, a popsicle. Uh, but uh, that was about it. Uh, How about any Tootsie Rolls? Oh yeah, I was just gonna mention that. They're, um, they airdropped us Tootsie Rolls. They must have found every Tootsie Roll they could find in Japan. What happened is the story I get is that uh, the code word for 60 millimeter mortar shells was Tootsie Rolls. So when we were running low on 60 millimeter mortar shells, we sent the code words out for Tootsie Rolls. Some Air Force guy got the code word, took it literally, and they'd airdropped us all kinds of Tootsie Rolls. So, yeah, we had a lot of Tootsie Rolls. Mm -hmm. Well, you could put them in your mouth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when we got to uh, Coterie, uh, the best food I had, uh, was two cans of Hormel chili. Uh, our driver, I woke up in the middle of the night and he was sitting by the fire thawing Hormel chili. But uh, other than that, I also had uh, our, uh, we had a Jeep trailer that uh, carried our ammunition in that. And when you were in a uh, truck convoy, uh, if, you, if you ran across your Jeep trailer, we had a gallon can of mincemeat, mincemeat pie. And uh, we had the cover cut off and we just reach in and scoop out a handful of mincemeat and we'd eat it with our dirty hands and like our hands. <laughs> Are these memories still pretty vivid in your mind or are they fading, you think? Oh, it, uh, the horridness of it is kind of 
dissipated. I don't have the nightmares I used to have, but uh, it's kind of slowed down. I, uh, I have memory loss of a period of time I was over there. I don't know what happened. What was the hardest thing you saw or experienced at the Chosen Reservoir? Or did you see friends killed or wounded? Were you with them at the time when they were hit? Can you mm -hmm. give me an incident where it was and who, who was hit and what happened? Well, at the Chosen, uh, in my squad, we were lucky. Uh, my squad, between, between Hagaru and Coterie, my squad leader, uh, he got shot in the groin. I took him to the, to the uh, aid uh, ambulance and uh, 15 minutes later, I took the Navy corpsman to the same ambulance. That's not horrible, but uh, uh, the point I was going to make is when we got to Coterie, they were flying out the wounded. Two days later, my squad leader came back. I asked him, what are you doing here? He's out there. The guy's more wounded than I am. I'm walking out with you guys. And he walked out with me. He's in that picture. But uh, most gruesome detail, I... Uh, you know, you guys with their heads blown off and from mortar shells and stuff like that. It's when you first see that, though. I mean, do you react to it? Do you? I mean, you just does it seem real at the time, or does it seem like a, something that's surreal? Well, after you've been in combat for a while, it's. It's just, okay, it's him, not me. Do you think as a young man, did you ever feel invincible, like nothing could happen to you, and then you realize you could get killed doing this? Uh, you really, I never really thought about my, my getting killed as such. I knew, I knew it could happen, but those are my odds. When you're fighting as a Marine, are you conscious of the history of the Marine Corps, the pride? I mean, no. You're, you're there with your buddies. One for, you're taking care of each other. That's what you're taking care of. You've got a, you've got a mission or a uh, an objective that you have to take, get to, and you're with them, and that's what you're going to do. The history of the Marine Corps, that's, that's wonderful to think about some other day, but you don't think of it then. And what does freedom mean to you? What does freedom mean to me? Do what I please. The ability to do as I please. How about the price for freedom, the cost for the freedoms we have today? What would you say about that? It comes high sometimes. Very high. A lot of people don't realize that, especially the younger generation today. I admire those uh, volunteers today those kids over in Iraq and Afghanistan and that, they're all volunteers. I think they're wonderful. What does the American flag mean and represent to you as a veteran? Uh, I could cry when it goes by. It means this country, everything. The people that died for everything. 
Are you proud to be a Korea veteran? Sure. Proud to be a Marine. Still am a Marine. Have people thanked you for your service? I've had a few thank me. Just a few, huh? It's interesting. Uh, uh, you're probably aware that I'm a, that there is a, a chosen few organization. Well, I I belonged to it for a number of years, and I'm just hoping I can make it to the next reunion next year in Washington D.C. 2008. What month? I think it's in August. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to hope to have this while. This film will be done, and I've had contacts in the past, but I want to contact the people in charge of that reunion about this documentary. Um, um, do you have any problems today? Hands, feet? Do you sleep with your socks on? I mean, do you sleep with my socks on? I have neuropathy with my feet. I uh, I can't walk uh, or stand more than five to ten minutes, and my feet are go completely numb. Uh, my back, uh, if I walk from here to my car, uh, that's about as far as I can walk with my back. That was the back because of the war? I don't know. It, uh, if it is or not. My fingers are numb and stiff all the time, too. From, from the war? Cold, yes. Yeah. Neuropathy, the cold. High blood pressure, diabetes. Uh, How old are you now? 78. When you see pictures that you, you brought me some pictures today, when you look at yourself back then, what do you think about it? God, I was young. <laughs> young and crazy. Once a Marine, always a Marine. Yeah. Well, I tell you, I owe a lot to the Marines. I, um, it, it gave me discipline. It gave me aggressiveness. It gave me the GI Bill. I went to college, I became an engineer, I had the aggressiveness and the get ahead of us. I ended up getting damn good jobs, rising through the ranks. I made a heck of a good living. I'm retired and I'm living darn well. And I owe it all to the Marine Corps. How did your experience in Korea and in combat change you as a person? Made me very confident. Can anything in civilian life compare to what you experienced in combat? I don't think so. I, I, don't, I don't think it can. You ever been to the Korean War Memorial in Washington, D.C.? No. Mm -hmm. I hope to see that next year. Mm -hmm. I haven't been in Washington, D.C. since uh, I was stationed at Quantico, Virginia as a uh, instructor at the base officer's basic school until I got hijacked to uh, Paris Island as a drill instructor. How long were you a D.I.? Oh, about seven months before I got discharged. Was that a good time for you? Oh, it's hard duty. Hard duty. Did you have to be somebody that you're not? I mean, to those young recruits? I mean... Well, not really, but... Uh, <laughs> I went to drill instructor school. I lasted two hours, and I was assigned to a platoon. Why is that? I was asked to come out and drill the other drill instructors in school. And I drilled them and the sergeant called me over and said, report second recruit training battalion, you are now a drill instructor. Boom.
Were you one of the guys that yelled at him getting off the bus? Yep. Was that a normal type of yeah. behavior for you to be able to do that? No, well, it, it became normal. Uh, no, I was normally not a yeller uh, that, but uh, you fill that, fall into that mode, start yelling at them all the time. What's your goal? What's the end result of all that yelling, discipline? What, what's the end result in that recruit that you're trying to instill? Well, you're, you're trying to get them to drop their civilian ways. Uh, uh, I guess some people say take the mother out of the baby or that, but uh, you're trying to get them to react to obedience of orders. For? Follow up uh, later on when they're given an order that they follow it. Which would ultimately be a combat situation. That's right. That's interesting. I'd love to talk with you more about that too. I've met a few guys that have become DIs and it's interesting. I think everybody needs some of that in their life, civilian or not, I mean, you know, but. Um, the ch one more question about Korea. Just why did we get involved in Korea? What happened that caused us to get involved in Korea? Oh, from what I know, and I, I was an innocent bystander. <laughs> I was at the uh, Del Mar racetrack on detached duty uh, when the uh, Korean War broke out and the North Koreans came across the 49th parallel, 38th parallel, and uh, I guess Harry Truman decided that he was going to stop the communists. So we stopped the communists. Were you ever able to help anybody that was wounded? I know you had Corbin, but were you personally ever able to help somebody? Or could you help anybody that was wounded in, in, in Korea? Well, you, you stopped uh, and uh, looked to see how bad they were hurt. and and uh, if a corpsman wasn't handy, uh, uh, slapped uh, their first aid bandage on them uh, and uh, yelled for the corpsman. I'm gonna ask you to do one more thing. Um, at the end of my interviews, I always ask the veteran to give me a salute into the camera. From where you're seated, can I ask you to do that when I tell you just a second here? Sure. Okay. Okay, and look right into the camera. Give me a salute. Go ahead. Thank you.